On a cold, late winter's day in March of 1960, three friends went on a hike at Starved Rock State Park in Illinois. Their names? Francis Murphy, Mildred Lindquist, Lillian Oding. They were on the search for a well-known point of interest, a beautiful frozen waterfall in St. Louis Canyon. But instead, they found evil, or better yet, evil found them. This is Chester Weger, a young man with a troubled past which came back to haunt him. He worked as a dishwasher at Starved Rock Lodge and became a special person of interest. 15,000 police interviews and over 21,000 man hours went into finding who was responsible for these heinous murders. And in the end, all signs pointed to Chester Otto Weger. But was Weger actually guilty of these murders? Were corrupt officials just nearing their wit's end and looking for a scapegoat? Do the ends always justify the means? Well, regardless of how you feel about Weger, maybe we should consider other possibilities. This is William Jansen. He was a criminologist that spent weeks at Starved Rock State Park while investigating these murders. And what if I told you that his findings completely opened the door to the idea that Chester Weger is an innocent man? investigation before Uyghur became the focus of this horrific crime, Police Chief William Morris assigned the Starved Rock murder case to William Jansen, a 25-year-old criminology expert. Jansen spent 11 weeks in Starved Rock State Park that culminated in a 40-page report. This is what Jansen had to say. Two men, possibly poachers or revengeful hoodlums, were the perpetrators of these crimes, while authorities believed it was the work of a so-called lust killer. Jansen's report made mention of a possible abnormal sexual act inflicted on one of the bodies, but believed that this was not the motivation for the killings. Jansen criticized the handling of the case by police in his report. He cited what he called incomplete autopsies, lack of adequate photographs of the crime scene, unsatisfactory interrogations, and a failure to maintain the perimeter of the crime scene until it could be secured and search for clues. Jansen said, I believe the crime was more a revenge crime than a sex crime. He recommended that friends, family members, and business associates who knew the victim should be questioned, and he specifically mentioned that the malign area be the target of the investigation. Mrs. Francis Murphy's husband once served as an attorney in Malign, and Jansen suggested it should be determined if he incurred enemies in that area. The possibility that poachers may have been responsible for the killings came from what looked like possible dog hairs found on a body. The report named several persons as suspects, but the names were never released. Jansen said that state police were seeking to question an inmate at the Bartonville State Hospital who was an escapee at the time of the killings, but the hospital were blocking their efforts. Jansen went on to say that the women were beaten by a camera, binoculars, and a tree limb, but said the murder weapon had not been found. He favored a steel bar or a tire iron to the tree limb that authorities claimed to be the murder weapon. His reconstruction of the crime places the date of the killing on March 14th at around 2.30 p.m., he believed the women were given at least one ride by a motorist from Starved Rock Lodge 
to St. Louis Canyon. Jansen speculated that Mrs. Murphy broke away after the three women were attacked by two men and tried to scale the canyon wall. Jansen said she was caught by one of the attackers, dragged back to the cave, tied, and later killed. One of the women, he said, was killed near the cave, while the other, as Mrs. Murphy, was tied before she was slain. Jansen's report gives us a detailed insight into how these murders may have really been committed and by whom. If Jansen was correct, then Uyghur should have never been a suspect or been convicted of this crime. Did authorities ever give any credence to Jansen's 40 pages of expert knowledge, or were they driven by their own agendas? If authorities truly were correct about Uyghur's guilt, we would have to believe what Sheriff Yudzi said about Uyghur's actions. Yudzi said that Chester Uyghur showed no remorse as he admitted to killing three women while on a break from his job as a dishwasher at the lodge. He said that Uyghur returned to his job after the slayings as if nothing had happened. Nick Spiros, a concessionaire at Starved Rock, said the arrest of Uyghur shocked him. We can't believe it. We had no reason to suspect him. He never bothered anyone here, nor did he use foul language. He was a nice young man. He worked with us for six weeks after the murders. Two different opinions of the same man. Could Uyghur flip his personality on and off like a switch? Was he a cold-blooded killer like Yutzi wanted us to believe? Or was he a nice guy like Nick Spiro said? Which one was the real Chester Uyghur? The deeper you delve into the Starved Rock murder case, you are instantly made aware of how problematic the investigation had become from the beginning. In April of 1960, a newspaper article detailed the problems in the investigation. Starved Rock was outside the jurisdiction of any experienced and well-trained city police department. The result was a glaring dispute by both the state and county agencies for the bungling of the case. After accusations continued to intensify over the mishandling of evidence in the triple murders, BCI Chief James Christensen resigned. Christensen blamed LaSalle County authorities for delivering case materials to the lab in such a condition that it was a bunch of useless trash and had no value as evidence. Christensen said he was forced to operate out of a cramped three-room shop on the sixth floor of the state armory. One lab technician added, we are so ashamed of the crime lab that we try to steer visiting police officials away from it. State Police Chief William Morris hit back by not only bringing in expert William Jansen, but he also flew evidence out of state for re-examining. Morris claimed that Christensen told officers that five or six smudge fingerprints found on the victim's clothing could not be identified. The smudges appeared on a stocking, the hem of a slip, and a girdle. The articles were sent to Michigan for further analysis. Other evidence that was retested included strands of hair found in Mrs. Oding's hand, and slivers of bark removed from her skull, two red Orlon fibers found on the victims, bits of chrome metal found on Mrs. Murphy's overshoe. Film found in the camera of one of the victims was also reviewed. Testing was limited in 1960, and the coroner was never able to determine if the women had been raped. The 18 strands of hair found in Mrs. Oding's hand were identified as brown, and the eight strands of hair found in Mrs. Murphy's glove were identified as blonde. This information opened the door to the possibility of more than one attacker. 
The confession from Uyghur at 1.45 a.m. on November 17th was just the beginning of sealing his fate. Even though Uyghur recanted his confession, the state moved forward seeking the death penalty. State's attorney Robert Richardson decided to file charges against Uyghur for only one of the three murders in the event of a mistrial or an acquittal. If that happened, Uyghur could still be held accountable for the other two murders. Uyghur, who maintained a calm demeanor throughout most of the trial, began to blink continuously and the veins in his neck seemed to swell with tension as Richardson demanded in his closing argument that Uyghur be sent to the electric chair. Uyghur's defense counsel, John McNamara, asked that he not be found guilty, saying the prosecution's evidence was circumstantial. McNamara placed all the blame on Deputy William Dummett and then State's Attorney Harlan Warren. McNamara told the jury that State's Attorney Warren was running for re-election and the Starved Rock case had become a thorn in his side. McNamara detailed how Warren re-initiated the investigation and had Deputy Dummett assigned to him. Dummett eagerly took the task of hanging the murder on Uyghur. McNamara said this about Dummett. He cherished a dream of being elected sheriff in 1962, and he would be in line for a share of the $35,000 reward money posted by the victims' families. He went on to say, They wanted to upset Chester Weger and prime him for the confession they later got under duress. Poor Chester was too stupid to go and see someone who knew the law and could have saved him from these indignities. A jury of seven women and five men returned a verdict of guilt. Chester Weger was sentenced to life in prison. Weger would be eligible for parole in 20 years. Weger's attorney filed an appeal which made its way to the Illinois Supreme Court, but the verdict was affirmed in September of 1962. The Starved Rock investigation in Weger's conviction have remained a source of contention over the decades. Some believe Uyghur was justly sentenced for the crimes he committed. Others believe that the bungled investigation let the real killers go free. There were many eyewitness accounts that put other suspects in the area the day of the murders. Were these accounts even taken seriously by law enforcement? If so, how thoroughly were they investigated? This is what we found. 36 boys from the rehabilitation camp that participated in the search when the women went missing knew the park very well. Camp director Stan Potter said, We're pretty sure all the boys were accounted for when the murders occurred. We make a check every 20 to 30 minutes, day and night. But... Were all the boys really accounted for that day? Reverend A. W. Heflin was taking photographs near the scene of the crime on the 14th. He reported hearing a woman's voice and saw workmen in the area. A LaSalle County auto salesman told police he saw a gray 1959 Plymouth station wagon in the parking strip of the St. Louis Canyon on March 14th. The salesman also saw a red-haired man talking to three women at about 2 p.m. They were on the shoulder of the Illinois Highway 178 near the mouth of St. Louis Canyon. The salesman then saw the same station wagon near Hennepin Canyon, four and a half miles from St. Louis Canyon. A small creek flows under the highway, and it was suggested that the killer or killers could have washed away blood there and not have been seen from the road. Poachers had recently been seen operating in the park that winter. The trapping of mink, muskrat, and fox had been a problem for conservation officials in the 1,475-acre park. The women may have surprised some poachers. 
According to a farmer, he saw two men hitchhiking at about 4 p.m. between the Illinois River Bridge and the west entrance to the park in the area of St. Louis Canyon on March 14th. The farmer said they appeared to be in a panic to flee the area as they walked in front of oncoming traffic. The men were between the ages of 25 to 30 years old, 5 feet 6 to 5 feet 8 inches tall. It's believed that the farmer's car appeared in photos taken by Reverend Heflin the day of the killings. A witness said they were told a relative of one of the victims arranged for mobsters to kill the women. An alleged mobster confided his involvement in the killings. He claimed that he and others put their bloody clothes in his car and drove to another county to burn evidence. A telephone operator claimed that she heard a conversation shortly after the killings between two men discussing the disposal of bloody clothes. Given this array of possible suspects, perhaps law enforcement should have closely considered criminology expert William Jansen's report detailing how the murders occurred and who may have committed them. After being denied parole 23 times, 80-year-old Chester Weger was released to a Chicago Rehabilitation Center by the Parole Board in November of 2019. On February of 2020, Weger was released from the rehab and now resides with family in LaSalle, Illinois. Chester continues his pursuit to have his conviction overturned. He says he's an innocent man wrongly convicted of a crime he never committed. On August 1st of 2022, a hair from Francis Murphy's glove was sent to a lab for analysis. The DNA excluded Uyghur. An attempt to cross-check it against a DNA database resulted in no match. Chester Uyghur's battle to clear his name goes on. The victim's families are outraged by his release and all of the claims of misconduct. They believe the right man was convicted of the crimes that he himself admitted to. This is Francis Murphy, Mildred Lindquist, and Lillian Oding. On March 14, 1960, they visited Starve Rock State Park for a little rest, a little hiking, a little time away from their hectic lives. The unthinkable happened. Evil stepped into their path and beat them over 100 times. The lacerations were too many to count, and their heads were nearly decapitated. No matter what you believe about this case, if justice is to be truly served, then every piece of evidence must be explored and all possibilities must be exhausted. If evil is to be brought to justice, then we should match evil in the same manner it strikes relentlessly. This will conclude our two-part special covering the Starved Rock murders. If you have any new information concerning this terrible crime, please contact the LaSalle Police Department at 815-223-2131. Thank you for tuning in today. If you like our videos and would like to help our channel grow, please consider sharing this video with a friend. Also, if you aren't already subscribed to EOJ, please consider doing so. It's completely free and it's the best way to stay in the loop about our channel and get notified when videos will be uploaded. As always, stay well and be safe. Until we see you again with another cold case, this has been Eye on Justice.